Good morning from Calvary Chapel Southside, where Jesus Christ is Lord. And it's awesome to see everybody here this morning, so many people. And uh, we'll pray, we'll get started. We're going to start a new book this morning. We're going to start the book of Mark. It's great to see so many people. Worship was awesome, wasn't it? Praise the Lord. All right, Lord, we ask you to bless us this morning. Watch over us, protect us. We thank you, Lord. It's great to see so many faces and smiling and the sun shining. Lord, you're awesome. We love you. We can't wait to see what you have for us. So bless us through your word. Thank you, Father, for this week. You got us through another one. We know you'll get us through all the rest of them, too. And today, in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Well, we're going to start out... We're going to start out in Acts chapter 15. Joe, you're good to go? All right, so Acts chapter 15. Where we are in this here, uh, Paul and Barnabas are together, a missionary team there. Seriously opposing the Judaizers. Now, the Judaizers were guys, Jews who got saved, they're Christians, and they think that everybody should become a Jew and do all the Jewish stuff to be a Christian or to continue in Jewish tradition while they're Christians. And really what uh, Barnabas and, and Paul want to tell these guys is, hey, Christians have freedom in Christ. They don't have to go that route. We weren't that root because that's who we, we were. We were Jews and all that. But So knowing they had come to rob the Gentile believers in their liberty in Christ, these guys meet the, this council and these other guys in Antioch to discuss it. They meet to discuss all these things. And then in verse 35, Acts 15, 35, Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days after, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Let's pray. Lord, we pray your blessing on your word. Again, thanking you, praising you. Lord, you are the Lord of lords. You are the King of kings. And we honor you now 
We thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us your word. Give us understanding according to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So we see here these two men decide to go back and visit all the places where they went. To visit all the places where they evangelized. They just want to see how everybody's doing. You know, how badly have we wanted to see how everybody's doing during this pandemic? We, we wonder how everybody's doing, you know, and it's tough to... Can you imagine back then? They would have to travel from city to city, no phones, no internet, no, you know, any of that stuff. So they decide to go back to people they've already preached to. Let's see how they're doing. Good plan. In verse 37, And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. This is John Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed, because he had departed from them, from Pamphylia. Now, really what had happened, John Mark bailed on this mission trip. Young guy, he bailed out on their first mission trip, and he went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between Paul and Barnabas, so sharp, that they departed asunder one from the other. They split. So Barnabas said, let's take John Mark with us. I know he backed out last time, but I see potential in him. Barnabas means son of consolation. I like that because he's an encourager. Son of consolation. Good guy. A guy that you'd want to have around. Not only that, he's Mark's uncle. <laughs> he's Mark's uncle. His sister is uh, Mark's mom. So Paul insists we can't afford to bring somebody we can't count on. Leave him here. So here we have Paul thinking he chickened out in Pamphylia. What can he do for God's work? But we've got Barnabas thinking, what can God's work do for him? I like that thinking. I like that. You know what? Let's get him busy again. Let's give him another chance. How many chances have you had? You ever notice how we are as Christians sometimes? We th a name comes up and we think of what he did 25 years ago and we're still holding that in our heart. How come? Or what he did a year ago to me. Or what you heard him do. Or whatever it is. Why we hold these grudges against people. You know? Well, I'll never get over the fact that he... What? I, I just... I, God gives us so many second chances and third chances. and Anyway... What can God's work do for him? So they're both right. They had quite an argument, and now they split up. But you know what? God uses this for good, doesn't he? How much does he use for good? Even things like this. Because now there are two teams, not just one team. I like that idea. Two, two dynamic teams, not just the one. So evidently, the consoling ministry of Barnabas had paid off. Um, God uses both these guys, and... I'm sure being with Barnabas, this son of consolation, I'd love to hear the discussions that he had with Mark as he took Mark out. It'd be interesting to know. So he uses it for good. Now there's two teams, and Barnabas had talked with Paul, and but, or I'm sorry, with uh, Mark. But um, Mark, or Marcus, is now... Back in the field, he's busy again, and so evidently this consoling ministry pays off. The ministry of Paul obviously paid off too. Now he picks up a man named Silas, or Silas was there too, but now he goes out with Silas. He strikes off with Silas, but Mark, or Marcus, he became reclaimed, I, I guess we could say, spiritually, because a few years later, listen, when Paul's in prison waiting to die, this is the last words of Paul. He's, he's in prison. He's allowed visitors, but he's waiting to die. And here he is. He writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.11. He says, only Luke is with me. Luke's the only one I know around here who can come and visit me. It's only Luke. And he says, <clears throat> take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So he's telling Timothy, when you come to visit, bring Mark with you. The same Mark. The same Mark given 
another chance and another ch Well, you know what? Believe it or not, this same Mark eventually is going to write a gospel. How about that? Did you know that? <laughs> He's a writer of one of the four gospels. So that's what we see continued in verse 39. Look at verse 39. And so Barnabas took Mark and he sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended to the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia. They went through southern Turkey as well, confirming the churches. So the Lord used interpersonal difficulty to send two teams out instead of one. And as a result, we have twice as many believers encouraged, twice as much ministry ensues. How about that? I like that idea. Now turn to Mark's Gospel, if you would. It's the shortest of the four of them, the four Gospels. It has 16 chapters. It moves really quick. Um, many have considered the Gospel of Mark to be written as the first, the first Gospel. The first Gospel written. And we know that he wrote it before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD because he speaks of that event as it's, it's still being future when he wrote, according to uh, Mark chapter 13. So this is a much quicker presentation of Jesus' life. It moves quickly, you know, than the other Gospels do. It would be appropriate because Mark's main audience are Romans. And the Romans, you know, they're kind of people on the move. You know how those Italians are, I guess, right? You know? <laughs> Fast-paced. So it also explains why there's only two Old Testament references in Mark. Just two Old Testament scriptures that are, are quoted in Mark's Gospel. And, I mean, think of that compared to, like, Matthew's Gospel. When you think of Matthew's Gospel, there's so many, um, so many scriptures that he brings up in the Old Testament because he's writing to Jews who would know the Old Testament. So he had many Old Testament references. Luke's Gospel was written for the Greek mindset. Matthew's again for the Jew. Uh, Luke for the Greek mind. You know, the scholarly type stuff. Luke was a physician. So um, John's Gospel was written for the whole world, for everybody. John saw Jesus as the Son of God. God the Son. Luke sees him as the perfect man. Matthew sees him as just this, you know, the king. The, um, Mark sees him as a servant. I like that idea, the servant. You ever really think about what it means to be a servant? Many, many of us, maybe we weren't brought up with a, the, the old work ethic. Many of us, maybe we were. I think this really helps us understand the... the the work ethic in the, in the eyes of the Lord as we go through this gospel. So again, Mark writing to the Romans, Matthew wrote to the Jews, Luke wrote to the Greek mindset, John wrote to everybody. So we don't see a lot of abundant sermons and discourses in this because, again, he writes to the Romans. And since he writes to the Romans, uh, it moves quick. So. Instead of the emphasis on the works rather than the words of Jesus Christ, it's, he emphasizes uh, the works more than the words even. But again, Mark's full name was John Mark. John is his Hebrew name. Mark or Marcus would be his Roman name. John Mark was well suited for writing this gospel because of his background. We know from Acts chapter 12 that he was the son of a wealthy woman named Mary. She evidently was pretty well off, Mary. Um, the early church met in her house. His mother owned the house in Jerusalem where the early disciples gathered to pray. A lot of people figure that probably her house was where the upper room was. Maybe even the very house where Jesus had the very first you know, communion, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the Passover, but as we know it, the Eucharist, communion. Maybe it was that very place where he instituted the Lord's Supper. Jesus was probably a close friend of Mark's family. Now Peter 
Peter refers to Mark as his son, my son, you know, my son in the faith, 1 Peter 5. And literally that means spiritual son. Like, like Paul would say, Timothy is my son, meaning spiritual son, not a blood son. So a spiritual son. So it definitely seems that Peter was quite influential in Mark's conversion. They were probably close friends. And that causes many to believe then that Mark's gospel was actually Peter's gospel. We know Mark wasn't with, Peter, uh, with Jesus in all of his travels, but Peter was. So what I, I believe this too, that Peter informed Mark of all the events contained in this book. So it, we could say it's, it's kind of like Peter's gospel then, isn't it? You know, transcribed by Mark, dictated by Peter. Peter would tell him what was going on, Mark would write it down. I like that idea. So I, I think he informed Mark of the events contained in this book. It was probably dictated again by Peter, scribed by Mark. Many scholars believe they're hearing the words of Peter, but they're also getting the heart of Peter as well. You know, sensing the heart of Peter as they study Mark's gospel as well. So, again, Matthew presented Jesus as the king, right, in his gospel. Luke presented him as the perfect man. John presents him as the son of God. But this gospel, Mark, presents Jesus as a servant. Normally, when we see the word servant, we think of the word doulos in the Greek. It means bond slave. Okay, here we're going to see Mark, and it's going to use another word for servant. Um, we see, you know, him being depicted as a servant is interesting. That's why you don't see a genealogy in this book. You notice the other books have a genealogy. This one doesn't because who, who, really, who really cares about a, a, a servant or a slave's genealogy? Nobody I know of. Anyway, so that's one of the reasons why it's not in here. But chapters 1 through 10 portray the servant living his life in service. Then chapters 11 through 16 portray him as giving his life in sacrifice. In Acts chapter 13, verse 5, Mark himself was called a servant. The literal translation for us would be minister as he accompanied his uncle Barnabas and the Apostle Paul on their first missionary journey into Asia Minor, Minor or present-day Turkey. Although it's translated minister there, this word for minister there, the Greek word is huperetes. Huperetes. And it literally means under roller. Now, again, we have the two words for servant. We have doulos, bond slave. Here we have huperetes, and it means minister. And it's interesting because really what it means is under rower. Like the under rower in a ship. The guys down below that nobody sees. You know, I don't know if you remember, what was it, Ben-Hur with Charlton Heston and the guys down in the bottom, you know, the, the, ro the under rowers and all. That's what this means, under rower. Like in a Roman galley. And on the top deck, all the passengers or the soldiers or whatever they are, they're enjoying the cruise on the Mediterranean. But down below, where the passengers can't see, are all the huperetes, all these under rower guys. They're, you know, they're down there sweating and nobody sees them hour after hour, day after day. For weeks, they, they just row and they row and they row and they sweat and they toil and all that other stuff. So working so the ship keeps moving. Think of it. The servant, unseen, working, sweating, so everything just keeps moving. I like the idea. It just keeps going, hour after hour. Maybe there's 80 of them or 120 of them all working together. If they're all, you know, button heads and not working together, the boat doesn't move too well, does it? It doesn't. So the hupe retes would be underneath rowing, sweating, working, and the ship is moving, so that it's, it's what it means, this is what it means to be a servant. Um, it doesn't matter if people see you doing it. It doesn't matter if you get attention for it. It doesn't matter if you're just one of the many and you're unrecognized. Oh, nobody sees what I do. Good. <laughs> he does. He does. That's the important thing. So it doesn't mean to lord it over people either. Barking commands from the upper deck. 
That's not it either. It means servant. It means to be a minister. It's one who undergirds, one who works behind the scenes, who toils steadily and faithfully, even though he may never be acknowledged or recognized. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It sounds like exactly what the Lord did, really. We're going to see, too. In much of his ministry, I know we, we see Jesus with crowds coming to him, but much of his ministry was not for the crowds, was it? We're going to see that too, though. So, if often the idea of minister then is wrong when you think about it. We think of, like me standing up here in front of everybody, but there's so much more to this. There's so much more that goes on. If in Calvary chapels, I mean, Warren would back me up on this, and I'd say Warren does the same thing. I, we don't know what we're going to do every day. We could be cutting grass, we could be counseling, we could be fixing, we could be painting, we could be, I don't know what, you know, we're studying, obviously praying, but there's so many different things that can go on. Um, so people have the idea of minister wrong. And if you wanted to be a true minister, a servant, a hupe retes, then you wouldn't care who saw you. You wouldn't, you know, then you'll labor in obscurity if necessary as an under. Mark's Gospel, we see Jesus moving away from the crowd and working in quietness, ministering in relative obscurity. And our focus is going to be on Jesus, of course, but a little bit more on Mark to set this up. I, I think Mark is an interesting character. We know so little about this guy. Like, why does this guy get chosen to, you know, have his name on this Gospel for forever and ever and ever? Well, I think it's interesting that he got chosen, but... Um, we're going to see here, uh, John Mark is mentioned in Philemon chapter 1, verse 24. Well, there is only one chapter, but verse 24, he's, he's mentioned by Paul as a co-laborer. So he did make it to Rome to be with Paul eventually, you know. So he's even recommended by Paul to the church of Colossae in, in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Which all led up to what I said earlier. He was requested by Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Bring Mark with you. He can really be a benefit to me. So Paul says to Timothy that Mark would be profitable to him for ministry. So again, Barnabas must have done a really great job in restoring Mark to the ministry. Encouraging him again. Because can you imagine being blown off by the Apostle Paul? Get out of here. We don't want you anymore. You know, and sometimes we get... We do that too. We, we might, as, as ministers, we might say, no, nope, putting you on the shelf for a little while. And I don't like to think of that. May, there, there may be a call for that at times, but you know what? That guy is due to come off the shelf too. He doesn't get stuck there. And I like that. Barnabas took him right away. He must have restored him pretty good, um, renewing John Mark. That Again, his young nephew went on to have a vital ministry, even to Paul in the Apostles' very last days. So, doesn't that give us hope? I hope that gives you hope, because haven't you ever fallen on your face? Haven't you ever, even in ministry, just bound, you know, crashed and burned? It gives me great hope, because haven't there been times in our lives when we've dropped the ball like Mark did? Of course. Of course. Or turned away, or fell down. How does it feel after those times? Because Often our, our tendency is to think, oh, I'll never be used again. Why do we do that? I'll never be used again. You know, there's a big thing called repentance. There's a big thing called, you know, restoration and, and deliverance and, and maturity. And if those steps are going on in our walk, the Lord can re reuse anybody. He can, trust me, He can use anybody. So... How does it feel after those times? I don't want anybody to think, I'll never be used again. Don't go there. Because you can be. Be encouraged. Try to remember John Mark, who even though he chickened out on his first ministry journey there, he went on to minister effectively, and not only to Paul, but to us. He's going to minister to us today through his writing, through the Holy Spirit. He's going to tell us about the life of Jesus Christ. So, Mark lives on in a way, doesn't he? I mean, he's with the Lord right now and everything, but we're gonna, he's going to minister to us through his gospel right here before us. So look at verse 1. 
Mark 1.1, 1, 1. the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You know, he, he's going to hit the ground running and he keeps going. I like the way his pace and everything. The gospel is, is not a discussion and it's not a debate. It's not a good view. It's, a good, it's not good views, it's good news is what the gospel literally means. And Mark wastes no time in getting to its heart. This is as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way the Lord make his paths straight. So Mark quotes, <laughs> he gets them right out of the way right away. He only quotes two Old Testament scriptures, just two, and they're right here. Verse 2 from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. And then he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3, quoted here in verse 3. So he gets them right out of the way. And they both refer, of course, to John the Baptist. Verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. This could really say, because of the remission of sins. We know that baptism doesn't wipe away your sin. Baptize, being baptized is recognizing yourself in Christ. You know, you're, you're outwardly displaying what's happened on the inside when you're baptized, all right? So the baptism of John, this, this one who came to prepare the way for Jesus Christ, it wasn't for salvation, but for preparation. It was the one who knew he had missed the mark, that one. The one who knew he was a sinner, the one who knew he needed a redeemer, you, then you would, I, I want to be baptized. So John's baptism was preparatory, but not complete because Jesus hadn't died for their sins yet. And there went unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. If, if baptism washed away your sin, then how come they're confessing? Confessing their sins. You need to confess your sins. Baptism is what cleans our sins away. You need to confess your sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat, did eat locusts and wild honey. I think being out in the wilderness, this is what he could get his hands on. I don't think it was required you can only have locusts and honey. I think he kind of ate whatever he could get his hands on. By the way, I found out that if you take a locust, if any of you want to try this, go ahead. <laughs> and cook it, it tastes something like shrimp. I don't know. I, actually, I wouldn't mind trying that. I love shrimp. But anyhow. Um, so, and honey's pretty good too. I mean, this is what he could get his hands on, I guess. This is just trying to show you that he was in the wilderness and he, <laughs> he didn't have it cushy. And he took what it, the land gave him, really, basically. And he preached, that's the important part, saying, there cometh one, listen to this, you guys, there cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I am not worthy to tie up his Nikes. I am not worthy in, by any means in his sight. I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose his shoes, his sandals. Imagine John the Baptist's voice here. You know, we, we read through this and we, we go on, yeah, cool, but picture him. I just picture him like his voice is kind of going with it. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and unloose his sandals. Because he knows who's coming. He has a great idea of who this coming person is. This is the Son of God. You know, I, I can't, I, I don't even know why he picked me. I don't even know why I'm able to even be up here and say this to you guys and, and baptize you guys. Why me? I just picture him like that. He says, I indeed have baptized you with water. You know, later on, he's going to go on in Mark 16, 16. And he's going to say, Jesus is, he's going to quote Jesus as saying, you need to believe and be baptized. But if you don't believe, you will be damned. 
That put it into perspective for me on the people who say, you must be baptized. Really? I think you become saved because you believed. You want to be baptized because he says you should be. You're identifying with him. But he says, if you don't believe, you'll be damned. He doesn't say, if, you don't, if you're not baptized, you'll be damned. Later on, you get that, right? I mean, it's so clear. It's so clear. But anyways, he, he says, I have... I indeed have baptized you with water, but he, the coming one, will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. You know, when you're born again, the minute you were saved, you were baptized into the family of God, you were baptized into the body of Christ. You're one of his. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now indwells you. But you know what? We can be filled, we can be baptized with the Holy Spirit. A little bit more on that in one second. So he says, I, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. You know, and I'm reading that and I'm like going on and I'm like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I want to go back to that. I want to, I want to dwell on that for a minute. John in the wilderness preaching, and all of a sudden Jesus shows up at the River Jordan. Picture this, right? As, as John called people to repent, suddenly Jesus shows up, and Jesus is requesting to be baptized. What? Why you? Well, Jesus had no sin. He certainly didn't have any need to confess sin. So why would he ask to be baptized by John? And I, I believe there's two reasons for it. Now, even though baptism is a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection, as we see in Romans chapter 6, the word baptizo was initially used in regard to dyeing cloth. You know, dunking cloth. Yeah. Dyeing cloth. Some of you have probably done this. but So baptism is not only a symbol of dying, but it's a symbol of dying, too. All right? So what's Jesus doing here? He's identifying with us. He's dipped in the same water that we are, so to speak. He's not ashamed of us. He does everything he can to identify with us. What more could he do to identify with mankind? He did it all. Even die. So he, he's identifying with us. He's dipped in the same water we are. He's not ashamed of us. He identifies. He meets us. We take on the same color, so to speak, in the same water of baptism. We take on the same color, if you think about it. So regardless of the fact that 2,000 years separate us from this event chronologically, and maybe 6,000 miles geographically, whatever it is, we identify with Jesus Christ and He with us through baptism. Now, not only does Jesus' baptism illustrate his identification, number one, with us, it shows his submission to the Father. He does everything according to the book, doesn't he? He does everything in the Father's will. It pleases him to please his Father. So, submission to the Father, because through baptism, Jesus is saying, I have come to die. Again, you know, for us, I don't know if you did this, when I went under the water in baptism, I died. I was buried down there, and then I rose back up. You know, I, I almost pictured the water like dirt, you know. I'm coming back up out of the dead because Jesus Christ lives in me. Identify with Christ. So, he says, I've come to die. Every other teacher, every other philosopher, every other guru, or whatever you want to call these guys, came to live, but their so-called ministries were cut short by death. Not Jesus. Jesus' death fulfilled his whole ministry. You know, those guys, their ministry ended when they died. Jesus' death fulfilled his whole ministry, and not only that, he's alive anyway. He's, he lives. Now, picture what John writes in his gospel, uh, chapter 1, verse 29. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. Picture that. Standing at the bank of the Jordan, and here comes Jesus. And John just stops and looks, and he looks at Jesus, and he knows by the Holy Spirit, that's him. It's him. 
This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I don't know how his knees weren't shaking so bad he fell down in the water. I don't know how he stood up. I don't know. He probably was choked. He probably couldn't say a whole lot. <clears throat> so, this is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And holy moly, it's my cousin too! No. <laughs> Seriously, though, you know, like, I knew he was a good kid. But anyway, I mean, I just picture these scenes, and I'd love to see this. I'd love to see John's reaction. I'd love to see John and Jesus' eyes be, yep, it's me. It is you, you know. Wow. <laughs> anyway, verse 10 here. And straight away coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. Again, that's from John. But conceived as he was by the Spirit in the womb of Mary, the Holy Spirit was already in Jesus. But here we see the Holy Spirit coming upon him. Here's where I want to go now again. Being born again, you're baptized into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit lives in you. But you can have the Holy Spirit come upon you when you need it. And I'm not saying just for ministry. And I'm not saying, please, if you hear this and you say, well, I don't want the baptism of the Holy Spirit because I'm not going to be a minister. You want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, trust me, because you want more. You want more. It can come upon you. It, we see the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus at the beginning of his ministry here, empowering him for service. So again, the Holy Spirit is in you. Pray, ask the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Lord, come upon me. Baptize me in the Holy Spirit because I want more. I want to be able to understand more. I, I want the gifts of the Spirit, whatever you decide. I want to do whatever you want me to do, but if I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit, it's going to be dynamic. Ask. You know, a, 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 maybe even a better word than the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the filling of the Holy Spirit. And it can be done again and again and again and again. And all you have to do is ask. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Can you picture that? God the Father saying this to the Son. Now even if it seems too good to be true, if you're a believer, this word of the Father applies to you as well because according to 2 Corinthians 5.21, we are in Christ. If you are in Christ, then He's pleased with you. Right? We're in Christ. So we can go through the day praising the Lord, casting our burdens upon Him, not because of who we are, but because of where we are. Where are we? In Christ. We're not because of what we've done or what we haven't done, but because we're in Christ. And look at this, verse 12. Uh, get used to this word, and immediately. Mark uses this word a lot. Mark uses the word immediately or straight away eight times just in this chapter alone, to illustrate the speed that he moves through his gospel. You know, not only that, how quickly can the Lord move? The twinkling of an eye, which is like hundreds and hundreds of seconds faster than a blink. The twinkling of an eye. And a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be in the air one day. Hopefully soon, I believe it's soon. But anyway, immediately, straight away, he moves through this gospel Immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. So immediately following the glorious experience of hearing the voice of the Father, the Holy Spirit leads Jesus off into the wilderness. I find this really interesting. Why? Not to do him in, it's actually to show him off. It's actually to show him off. You know what I mean? Suppose Tom and I, we wanted to go down to a local car dealer, and we wanted to test drive a truck. You know, sounds like fun, right? Well, we go down and uh, we get in, we jump into a four-wheel drive truck. We shift it into four-wheel. We go over some really rough terrain. We're taking it over hills. We're driving through creeks, you know, and all this. We're not trying to wreck the truck. We're taking it for a test drive. We want to see what it can do. We want to see how it performs. We take it into the wilderness and all that, you know. And so we're not wrecking it. Well, by driving Jesus into the wilderness, the Father's saying, in effect, watch my son, watch what he does, watch how he performs out there. 
on rough terrain and going through creeks and wilderness and all. Watch what he can do. You know, watch my son, because no matter what Satan throws at him, he's going to come through it beautifully. And the same thing's true of us, too. Listen, only what the Father allows can, can happen in your life. We spend a lot of time going, why me? Oh, I can't believe. You know what? He allowed it. Deal with it. Only what he allows happens can come true in our, in our, can happen in our lives. So when temptations or trials or difficulties or wilderness experiences or hard times come our way, it's because the Father has allowed them. And I think it's just like Jesus. He's allowed them in order to stop Satan's accusations. You ever put Satan to shame because you didn't cave? Because you listened to the Lord? You didn't freak out? You didn't panic? You didn't sin, of course. But think about this. Um, you're going through these times, hard times come our way. And the Lord has allowed them, and I believe, to silence his, Satan's accusations that we only serve the Lord in good times. See, he accused Job of that, remember that? Well, if I take everything away from him, he'll just trash you. He didn't. So I believe it's to show us off to a doubting world. Think about it. I, you know, I, I, I keep bringing him up and bringing him up, but I can't think of anything more potent to me than watching my brother go through what he went through with his disease at the end of his life, being such a tremendous witness. No matter what, no matter what happened. So I, I believe it's to show us off to a doubting world. It's to see how we react when these things happen. They're watching you. They're watching you at work. They see you freak out and panic and go crazy. They see you lose your mind or whatever it is. Or do they see you be the one that like, wow, that was amazing. How, where did you find patience like that? How come you're so loving? How come you're so forgiving? How come over all that rough terrain you didn't break down? And the question is, how do we look? You know, our, we're being test driven in front of the world. How do we look? Do people see in us something that they, they want? You know, and then when they ask, we can tell them what you really want is Jesus. He's test driving me right now. <laughs> And he was there in the wilderness, Jesus, of course, 40 days tempted of Satan. Now, 40 days reminds us of the 40 years God's people wandered in the wilderness. Jesus is in the wilderness, 40 days. The Israelites were in the wilderness, 40 years. And because the law will never lead a man into the promised land, the law, Moses, who speaks of the law, he was unable to lead the people into the promised land, wasn't he? The law can't lead you into the promised land. So Moses couldn't. Moses speaks of the law. Now it was Joshua. The, Joshua is the English word. I just met my neighbor across the street. His name's Joshua. Great opening little thing there. Joshua? That's a biblical name. He goes, yep. Now he's not a believer yet, but he's so open to it all. I, to, I told him, I said, you know, your name, Joshua, it's, it's English. In Hebrew, it's Yeshua. And in Greek, it's Jesus. And he's like, wow, that's cool. You know? And he was serious. He wasn't like just saying it to blow me off. Because we kept talking and all that. But same here. So Joshua, English, Hebrew, Yeshua, it's Jesus in the Greek. So we see Joshua representing grace. Joshua was the one who led them into the promised land. Not Moses. Moses represents law. Joshua Grace, Jesus, Joshua. So he brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, Joshua. So grace did, not law. Anyway, Jesus is in the wilderness, and he's being tempted. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. So because of his sin, the first Adam lost the dominion over nature that he was given way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. The first Adam. He was given dominion over the world. He lost it. So if we contrast that with the last Adam, Paul's term for Jesus, to whom dominion is returned, and we see here one bit of that evidence that it's by the wild beasts that surround him in the wilderness. 
Um, it's kind of like a sneak peek at the coming kingdom where the wolf shall uh, dwell with the lamb, Isaiah 11:6. The animals aren't going to bother Jesus, of course. But so where Adam failed in a perfect garden, Jesus came through in a barren wilderness. You know, you ever look at that guy down the street? He's, he, he's got a perfect garden. His house is just mint, and his cars, and his stuff, and all this. You, might, you don't know what's really going on in that guy's life. You know, you're thinking, well, my life's kind of barren, but I, I have Christ, you know? And then he doesn't have anything, and you've got everything. Anyway, so um, now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now watch this. He's right to the point. Here's Mark recording for him the first words of Jesus. Look at this. The first thing Jesus says is saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Point blank. Right there. So, and, and now the first disciples get called. See, he's really moving, isn't he? Verse 16, now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, that's Simon's brother, of course, Peter's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, come ye after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. I'm sure they were like, what? <laughs> now, <laughs> verses, look at verses 15 and 16. Look at this. One, two, three. Repent, believe, follow. What more do we need? Repent, believe, follow. You know, you get bummed out, repent, believe, follow. You think you're getting a rough deal, you're, he's test driving you over some really nasty situations, repent, believe, follow. That's what he calls us to do. That's it. I like it. Right away. What more do we need? One, two, three. And straight away, immediately, <laughs> We could say, do it immediately. But anyways, and immediately, they forsook their nets and followed him. You know what I like? There's no, hey, wait a minute, what about the pay, man? Do you have a dental plan? <laughs> you know, what's the health care like, you know? Do I, get, do I get vacations on this new job or? No, they, they don't even ask that. They don't even say anything about that. They forsook their nets and followed him. So there's, there's no, hey, wait a minute. And, and when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending or cleaning their nets. And straight away, immediately, he called them. I like you. You got a cool name. No, he didn't say that. But he calls them. Now, of the 12 guys Jesus calls, at least seven of them are fishermen. So to be a fisherman, you have to have patience and perseverance. I, that guy's a fisherman over there. <laughs> patience and perseverance. And those are qualities that are as valuable in fishing for men as they are in fishing for fish, obviously. Now it's interesting that Peter and Andrew were casting their nets. Now watch this. They were casting their nets into the sea when Jesus called them. On the other hand, James and John were mending or cleaning their nets. And that fits their personalities if you think about this. The ministry of Peter and Andrew is evangelism, as we know by seeing Andrew kept bringing people to Jesus. And then we see Peter preaching sermons. You know, in his biggest sermon on the day of Pentecost, he preached 3,000 people get saved. So they're casting their nets out there for fresh fish, for fresh men, right? The net of the gospel cast out. Now the ministry of John and James, by contrast, Think about this, was that of mending or cleaning nets. Personal ministry, I, I believe. Mending people through their emphasis on both the heartfelt and practical nature of love. One-on-one, -on -one, cleaning, mending, tending. It's not just standing up here and preaching the word. It's not just, event. you know, there are guys that all I want to do is go and preach the word, and then I don't want to do anything else. Well, that's not a shepherd, that's an evangelist. You know, these guys were shepherds. They could teach if they wanted to. But through their emphasis on the heartfelt, practical nature of, of love was, was their ministry. 
It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. So they could, they, they could come across in a more loving way, in a more personal way, maybe consoling and comforting and counseling and, you know, you're cleansing and mending. God's love. So personally, whatever your temperament seems to be, watch the Lord use it in your ministry. He'll use it in your ministry. He can, you know, use your, the characteristics you have in your personal ministry. Anyways, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after Jesus. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen this new series, um, The Chosen. Uh, it's pretty good. It's a Life of Jesus series. Candy and I watched it. And at this point, when Jesus comes and tells James and John, follow me, Zebedee was like, yeah, go ahead. You know, and I'm wondering, like, is that real? Is Zebedee really happy about that? But you know what? Zebedee had servants, which is interesting. So if, if we look here, again, they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after Jesus. So if we look here at Zebedee, Having servants means he had money. So maybe he was happy. Maybe he did look at Jesus the same way they did, and he just said, you, you better follow me. So they left their father. They left the boats and the nets. They were leaving what looks like a good career. Well, hey, man, I can make more money over here than following that guy. Who can't say that? There's no promise with it that... Nobody's going to say, well, you're going to get, if you get rich in ministry, something's, something's not right. But that's a whole other thing. So they're leaving what looks like a good career. They're leaving financial stability. Listen, if I've ever learned anything in ministry, it's that where God guides, God provides. God calls you. If God calls you, and I've literally said this to him, now I'm your problem. I'm your responsibility. You put me here. You called me this. You got to take care of us you got to provide. And he's like, yeah, I did. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I've learned he, where he, he guides, he provides. I've never asked um, what it was going to pay. Um, when we were in Canada, I was pastor at two churches at one time. That was, a, that was tough. Um, it was fun. It was busy. But the... <laughs> <clears throat> the two jobs together didn't pay as much as what I used to make as a graphic artist, you know. But anyways, Spurgeon said, when you can't do anything else, and I, I think about that, he didn't mean when you run out of options. When finally your job runs out, they lay you off, you've got nothing else to do, and your pastor's looking at you and he's going, hey, you want to get in ministry? That's not it. That might happen that way. But I mean, when you can't do anything else, it doesn't mean when you run out of options. It means you're called. And here, I believe that they could do no other because they found no other calling higher than to serve the King of Kings. There's no other. It's higher than just making money. I realize that, <clears throat> actually, Pastor Jack Trent, I went to him, I don't know, how long ago was that, 20-some years ago, and I said, I don't think I can do anything else. Now you're a graphic artist, keep doing that. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, pray that it goes away. So I did, and it did. And, you know, but I'm just saying, it got to a point where I, 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 I don't want to do anything else. I can't do anything. I can still do art. I, yeah, I mean, you know, but anyways. Enough about me. It's not about money or anything like that. Filet of soul was nothing anymore compared to having or saving a soul, I should say. These guys are fishermen. It's not filet of soul anymore. It's saving souls. So their net worth skyrocketed. And they got hooked <laughs> because they, they chose to follow the only one who could work through them the way he would. He, they would impact eternity. He would impact eternity through their lives. And they went into Capernaum and straight away, and again, immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue <clears throat> and taught. So the synagogue is in the temple. The temple is where the sacrifices are made, where the priesthood is served and all that. But the temple was in Jerusalem. 
Synagogues, though, they sprang up all over the countryside during the Babylonian captivity, what we're looking at on Wednesday nights. Those who were left behind, they wanted to worship. Some of them did. And they would spring up, these little synagogues, if there were ten men to found them. They had to have ten guys. So they were all over the countryside, sprang up during that captivity. They're unable to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. So it's a small established place whenever ten Jewish males could get together. And it's a place where there were no sacrifices, but they would get together and they would study the word. They would get together and pray and meditate and worship. So they're, they're not overseen by the traditional priesthood, but laymen through a council of elders would run this place and one of the elders would be the primary overseer appointed the ruler of the synagogue. So when a rabbi came into town, the leader of the synagogue would invite the, we, the rabbi, please, will you come in and speak? Please. This Sabbath, is, will you speak to the congregation? And the rabbi, of course, would. And he came into the area and he'd do this. He'd speak on the Sabbath day. But from the book of Acts, we know that Paul took advantage of this. When Paul went into a new city, everywhere he went, he'd be invited to speak, and he would. He took advantage of teaching in the synagogue, preaching over and over again. In verse 22, and they were astonished. Here's Jesus in the synagogue. They're astonished at his doctrine. I mean, how can Jesus not blow you away with the best Bible study you've ever had? How could that not happen, right? They're astonished at his doc doctrine, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Think of the wisdom coming out of him and everything. Think of, it's really, really, you want to talk about a sermon being grown, born in your heart? Huh. Think of Jesus. The scribes would speak from authorities and they'd quote the rabbis and everything. They'd quote the rabbis' teachings, but Jesus spoke with real authority. Jesus declared over and over again in, in Matthew chapter 5 and 6. I was looking this up yesterday. When Jesus spoke, he started off a lot of his teaching saying, you have heard it said, but... You've heard it said before, I'm adding before. I know you've heard this before. You've heard it said by other men, but I say unto you. It changes everything. But I say unto you. So they questioned his authority over and over again, though, didn't they? The scribes, the Pharisees. Who do you think you are? Which really meant, where do you think you're getting authority from? They're saying this to God. You know, so he's God, whether they believe it or not. In verse 23, And there was there in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Now, I can't get over the plurality there. So, is it more than one? Obviously, I think so. Uh, what have we to do with thee? Thou Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? Listen now to what he says. Here. I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Look at Maybe the guy who's Probably the guy who's the head of the synagogue doesn't believe this. Nobody in the congregation believes this. The demon-possessed guy shouts this out. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Wow. So even though this man may have sat undetected in the synagogue week after week after week, year after year, whatever it might be, sitting there, it wasn't until Jesus showed up that all hell broke loose, literally. So this shouldn't be surprising. Wherever the Son of God shows up, the forces of hell respond. They do. Remember James chapter 2, verse 19. He said, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. Then he says, The devils also believe and tremble. They know. They know. The devils will say, That's the Son of God. Right there, that's him. And then the Pharisees will be going, No, it ain't. You know, I mean, isn't that amazing to think of? They believe and tremble. In verse 25, and Jesus rebuked him. He rebukes the man, he rebukes the demon, really, or demons, saying, hold thy peace. 
Shut your mouth, hold your tongue, and come out of him. And it's an order. And you know what? You've got God standing in front of you giving you an order. You don't disobey that, even if you're a demon. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What's going on? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, think about it, he has all authority in heaven and earth. He has it all. He commandeth, he even the unclean spirits, they said, the demons, the devils, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region round about Galilee. So the demon or demons left, but not before they tore this guy up a little bit. Did he, maybe he got cut? Sure, I don't know. But you know what? The things we go through in life, the things that are evil sometimes, don't they leave scars? Don't they cut us? We remember them. They, maybe they hurt us pretty bad ones. We get over it, but we still have the scars. So whatever this means, he was the, the demon tore this guy up. But it's like us when we get rid of evils in our lives, we say, Lord, please have your way. And then we see the old habits go away, right? We see the old ways, the old things, the old wrong relationships, the bad patterns get forsaken and everything like that. They'll leave scars that remain. And like this guy, there might be some tearing initially, but we'll also experience freedom and blessing eventually too. So the miracle caused amazement. A man driving out demons. This is amazing. News immediately spread throughout Galilee. Now the first coming of Jesus aroused all this demonic activity on earth. The first coming of Jesus. The demons perked up and the activity increased. Think about the second coming of Jesus. Look at the demon activity that's increased right now. It's at an all-time high. I don't even know if you know. I get to a point where I realize how bad it is and I don't even want to know anymore. It's so intense right now. So I think we're close. So there's a great outburst of demonic activity on the earth before his first coming, and there's a super great outburst of demonic activity right now because I believe we're about to see the Lord come back. But Jesus' power over these evil spirits foreshadows his eventual triumph over Satan and all his agents. See, that's the thing. Doesn't he triumph over them all then? Doesn't he triumph over them now? Won't he triumph over them eventually? Of course. He wins. I read this book. He wins, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the ending's great. <laughs> We're with him. We win, too. So, again, he will triumph over Satan and all of his agent, agents. Keep it in mind. He won. Let's stand. Let's pray. It's going to be a good book. I'm really excited about this book. It's great to be back in the gospel. And Father, we thank you for the gospels. We thank you for the entire word of God. Lord, give us your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Holy Spirit too. Give us your Holy Spirit without measure. And we can pull everything out of here you want us to, Lord. We can, we can receive it and understand it and apply it. Lord, we love you. And it's great to be close to you uh, all the time. Father, thank you for these folks that are here today. Bless them, protect them. I pray that the folks here and out there, Lord, we all have a great day, a restful day. We enjoy this weather. Um, and we love you, Lord. Bring an end to this pandemic soon, Lord. Heal those that are sick. Bring out the truth. Bring justice, Lord. We, we need to see revealed, Lord, what your true plan is. Help us not to panic. Help us not to do, not interpret Scripture correctly or get ahead of ourselves, or not in the tribulation. Lord, I pray you'd give us understanding in the scriptures so we would know exactly where we are. We are with you. Thank you, Father. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.